Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. So hi, if you're new here, I'm Megan. I do video essays on different topics that catch my interest. I also do sewing tutorials from time to time and I talk about history, historical fashion. So if that's your jam, stick around. I'd love to have you. Um, and if you're old here, thanks for coming back and checking out my latest video. Mars is squaring Uranus this week, if you know, you know. So I thought, what an excellent time to move with that electric, rebellious, revolutionary energy and post a video that takes a critical look at how parenthood and motherhood in particular are constructed in our society. This video is the second in a two-part series about pronatalism, so if you haven't seen the first part yet, definitely go back and check that out because it talks about what pronatalism actually is, as well as some of the assumptions that it makes about motherhood and about women, so it's definitely a good idea to go and just give that a watch if you haven't already because this video kind of assumes that you have already watched that video. However, if you already know what pronatalism is and you're familiar with the concept and you haven't watched my first video, then definitely stick around because you'll already know what it is, so you don't need a primer. So anyway, I'll stop rambling now because we have a lot to cover. One more thing before I get started, if you haven't already, go ahead and gently tap that like button, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy these kinds of topics and want to stick around, and leave a comment down below and share your thoughts on having kids. I genuinely love and appreciate all the comments on these videos and I read each and every one of them even if I'm not always able to respond. All I ask is that you please be respectful to each other in the comment section and be mindful of the fact that this is a touchy subject for many of us and we're all coming at it with different experiences, opinions, worldviews, and challenges, so not everyone's going to agree with you and you know what, that's okay. That's what discussion is all about. So, okay, in this video we're going to examine pronatalism in the context of some actual societal trends and institutions, how it shows up in our lives and culture, and how it shapes our decisions. My goal in this this video is to make you aware of how pronatalism shows up in very real and concrete ways while also giving you a bit of historical context because that's what we do on this channel for where it came from in the first place and how it's contributed to overpopulation and climate change. I want to preface this video by reiterating that this is not meant in any way to blame, shame, or judge anyone for their choices either way. As I said in the first video, the personal is political, and I think a lot of the time we're not always conscious of how society and culture shape our individual desires and choices, so all I want to do in this video is to draw attention to some of the ways in which broader social trends get inside us so that we on an individual level can better understand which of our desires are social constructs and which are truly authentic to us. I think that if we can do that work on both an individual and a collective level, we can make better and more informed choices that are in alignment with what we truly desire and hopefully start to heal some of the generational trauma that comes from our ancestors not being able to make those same choices. The need for mythology about motherhood. For generations, we've been telling ourselves stories about the sanctity of childhood and the spiritual bonds between mother and child that are unlike any other, supposedly. The mythology Apologization of motherhood has been around at least since the Victorian era, and I believe that without these grand narratives, women wouldn't be as motivated to become mothers. So just think about it for a second. Why would you want to put yourself in a potentially dangerous situation, wreck your body, become isolated from yourself, permanently change all the other important relationships in your life, revolve your own life around caring for a baby 24-7 with no breaks unless you had some pseudo-spiritual reason for doing so? Our societal myths and stories that romanticize motherhood provide that reason. I'm not saying that there aren't people who genuinely do want to be mothers. Obviously, there are. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the people who are maybe on the fence or maybe weren't sure if they wanted kids, but then were convinced to do it anyway. Uh, there are plenty of those around and it's unfortunate. And a lot of these grand narratives around motherhood are aimed at people who are on the fence. So if you genuinely wanted to be a mother and you find fulfillment in that, that's amazing. I'm not talking to you. Before the invention of birth control and the criminalization of sexual violence, women didn't have a lot, if any, control over when and if they got pregnant. 
Though it's understandably hard to find good data about this, I'm going to hazard an educated guess and say that most pregnancies throughout history were unwanted, unplanned, and forced births that women had no choice about. Motherhood wasn't really sanctified in the past because it didn't need to be. It was just something that happened to women whether we wanted it to or not. But once childbirth became safer and women began to have more control over when and whether we had kids or not, these stories about magical motherhood were needed to convince a lot of us to do it. If everyone was aware all the time about the realities of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood, a lot fewer of us would do it. And that bears out in the stats. As more and more parents are speaking up about these realities, and as we're becoming more educated as a society, we are actually seeing fewer women deciding to have children than ever before. And that has the powers that be pretty shook, but I'll expand more on that later. For now, it's important to understand and contextualize the need for mythology surrounding motherhood if we really want to get to the heart of why pronatalism is as prominent as it is in our modern society. Like everything else we talk about on this channel, a little bit of historical context is needed. Infant and maternal mortality. Back in the day, people had a lot of kids because there was no healthcare, no modern medicine, and very often children didn't survive until adulthood. That's no secret, we've all learned that in history class. In fact, childhood mortality was the norm and living past the age of 20 was the exception, not the rule. For most of human history, one in two newborns died before reaching the age of 15, and that figure didn't start to decline until well into the 20th century. The causes of infant and child mortality were tragically very preventable. Most were caused by malnutrition, childbirth, and infectious diseases like pneumonia, malaria, and tuberculosis, all of which are now highly treatable and preventable, thankfully. Childbirth was also a leading cause for death for women before the 20th century, and by some estimates, pregnant women had about a 4% chance of dying from childbirth complications throughout their lives. Now, that seems low at first, but when taken in the context of an individual woman's life before modern medicine, it gets a lot scarier. In the year 1851 in Canada, the fertility rate was an estimated total of 6.56 children per woman. Keep in mind that this is the average, and many women women had closer to 10 children, but if we round up that average to 7 children per woman with a 4% chance of death from childbirth overall, your average Canadian woman had about a 28% chance of dying during any one of those 7 pregnancies. Keep in mind that these are just statistical averages and they would have varied according to each woman's age, socioeconomic status, health status, and the number of children she'd already had. That 28% chance of dying during any one pregnancy would have been much lower for younger, wealthier women who'd already had less children than it would be for older, poorer women who'd already been through multiple pregnancies. So all of you stats nerds watching, don't come at me. This is just an average. Also, I am not a statistician so if I did get that wrong, please let me know in the comments. I don't know about you, but if someone told me that something I was doing would result in a 28% chance of death, I probably wouldn't do it. For context, we modern people only have a 0.01% chance of dying in a car accident, which is currently one of the leading causes of death in modern society. Women throughout history were well aware of the dangers of pregnancy and childbirth, and they had very little control over whether or not they were going to do it. Sanctification of Childhood Before the 19th century, children were seen as helping hands and they were an economic benefit to their families because they directly contributed to household labor and expenses. They also worked outside the home in factories, mines, and in the fields. Generally speaking, the more children a family had, the greater their wealth was because children contributed directly to household income. Obviously, child labor is not ethical in any way, and I am not arguing that in any way, but for most of human history, it was the norm. As I already mentioned, birth control did not exist, so most women spent a good deal of their childbearing years being pregnant. Adding on to that, most children died before the age of 20, as I already mentioned, so the more of them you had, the greater your chances were that as many as possible would make it to adulthood. Before the 18th century, the broader social view of children was that they were little demons, based basically animals who needed training and education in order to become fully human. This all started to change with Enlightenment philosophy in the middle of the 18th century, which was the beginning of the sanctification of childhood. 
Actually, one of these days, I'm probably going to do a video essay on how enlightenment philosophy ruined everything. Uh, let me know in the comments if you're interested in that, because it's, it's a fun topic. Anyway, enlightenment philosophy ushered in broader social changes that began to view children as precious and innocent, rather than as little minions of Satan who were easily corrupted and had to be brought to heel. As the Industrial Revolution began by the middle of the 19th century, many children worked in factories and mines in dangerous conditions in order to help support their families. This reduced the lifespan of children even more, and during the 1840s, a series of labor reforms were instituted by Queen Victoria of England in order to protect children by either strictly regulating the conditions under which they were allowed to work or by banning child labor altogether. Accompanying these laws were a series of broader cultural and social shifts that imagined childhood as a sacred time and children as being helpless and innocent and in need of protection. During this time, there was an emphasis on education, and Victorian England also saw the establishment of a whole new industry that catered to children, with candy and toy manufacturing, toy stores, and a genre of literature written specifically for children. Stories like Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh come from this era. Side note, if any of my fellow millennial girlies played with American Girl dolls when you were younger, Samantha Parkington's entire storyline revolved around these child labor reforms and about how childhood was beginning to be socially constructed as a magical and precious time. Americans are good and kind, and good and kind people take care of children. I was obsessed with Samantha, by the way. I had like her entire collection at one point. Um, and now as an adult, I kind of understand why her storyline had such particular appeal to me because this is like a fascinating topic to me. Obviously, I feel really strongly about how our social views of children have shifted over time. Um, so maybe it even comes from there. I don't know. Anyway, as a result of all these social shifts around childhood during this time, children went from having material and economic meaning to being invested with emotional meaning instead. Nowadays, in our postmodern era, this is well established and not questioned, and children have gone from being an economic benefit to a financial drain on families. When you have a child, you expect that it will take up a significant amount of your resources, whereas if you were to have a child two or three hundred years ago, you would expect that it would add to your resources. The social and economic shift is really good on the one hand because it means that kids are protected from having to do labor that's physically, emotionally, and psychologically dangerous, which means less traumatized adults eventually, which is always such a good thing. Um, but on the other hand, it has become very expensive to have kids, and it's turning into a luxury that only wealthy people can afford. As society tends to do with a lot of things, like cars and social media, but that's another deep dive for another day, we've taken this way too far and created a kind of economic eugenics program where only the rich are allowed to reproduce while everyone else is barred from parenting because it's prohibitively expensive. More on that later. Our ancestors saw their children as little devils and demons that needed to be brought into line until they grew up and learned to be rational, reasonable, and pious human beings. Now we see children as little angels and we invest them with qualities of purity and innocence from birth and see them as being fundamentally precious and perfect until they grow up and are sullied by life and become horrible, jaded adults. In short, before the Victorian era, adulthood was more highly valued because it was more precious and rare. Lots of children were born all the time. Not very many of them got to become adults. And now it's the reverse. Childhood is more highly valued, especially with birth rates declining in many parts of the world, and as we see the demographic shift from there being more adults in the world and less children. This wide swing from one extreme to the other has informed a lot of how we conceptualize procreation and parenthood. Birthing and raising children and successfully safeguarding their innocence for as long as possible is seen as a most noble and worthy pursuit. One might even say the most important job in the world. Who wouldn't want to do that? In actual reality, and this is just my opinion formed from spending a lot of time around kids throughout my life, children are just people. Neither demonic and animalistic nor pure and angelic, children are people just like everyone else, just with a little less life experience and social graces. That's all. 
Have you ever watched kids interacting on the playground? Holy shit, they can be mean. And they can also be incredibly sweet and unconditionally loving. Just like everyone else, children are a mixture of light and dark qualities, and I don't think it's helpful or productive to invest them with such extremes of meaning either way, but that's just my opinion. The sanctification of childhood and children served a wonderful purpose in that it allowed Victorian families to rethink their attitudes towards children and inspired them to protect the safety and well-being of children who otherwise would have been sent to work in dangerous conditions. This was a very good thing at the time and very necessary, but modern society is starting to take this in a very pronatalist direction to the point where it's actively infringing on the rights and bodily autonomy of women. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, you can't talk about pronatalism without mentioning that, and the recent ruling in Alabama that frozen embryos are legally considered children, we've begun to project this emotional meaning not just onto children, but onto zygotes and embryos as well. As The Daily Show pointed out a couple of weeks ago, And I'm sorry, but if you could pass through a spaghetti strainer, you're not human. When the rights of metastasizing cells that hold the potential for life begin to trump the rights of living, breathing adult women, we need to ask ourselves if maybe the sanctification of children and childhood has gone too far. When we start to become more interested in controlling women and mothers than we are about protecting the health and safety of living, breathing humans, because we're not protecting actual living children right now either. If we were, then there would be stricter gun laws in the states and it would be much easier to adopt. Then we need to examine pronatalism as a weapon that's currently being used to control and subjugate women. You didn't think we were gonna get through this whole video without mentioning feminism now, did you? Pronatalism, religion, and nationalism. Last year, conservative influencer Abby Shapiro posted a video on YouTube about how every woman should have a baby. Motherhood is a vocation worthy of respect, more than not motherhood. Okay? Unpopular opinion. Oh, not this fucking bullshit again. In this video, she states that motherhood is not a choice and that the purpose of life for women is not to live for ourselves, but to serve others. She states that a life without children is meaningless and that if you're a woman and you find yourself either not married or not able to conceive, you should still be taking an active role in the lives of other people's children. I thought about linking to her video below so that you could go and watch the whole thing for yourselves, but I don't want to encourage views on her channel because she makes money from them. So instead, I'm going to link to a video by Rachel Oates, who's another content creator here on YouTube. And she did a fantastic and very detailed deep dive to Abby's little self-righteous ranty rant, so definitely go check that out if you want to see uh, that being picked apart because she did an amazing job. While technically not Christian herself, Abby echoes a sentiment that many far-right Christian fundamentalists, particularly in the United States, share, that the singular and sole purpose of a woman's life is to give birth and raise children. Women in fundamentalist religions are encouraged from an early age to prioritize finding a husband and becoming a mother, regardless of their desire or ability to do so. Quiverful is a Christian nationalist movement that has grown among conservatives in recent years. The term quiverful refers to a passage in Psalm 127 that reads, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. The movement takes this passage quite literally and encourages couples to let God plan their families for them by not using any form of birth control. Those who follow this movement believe that God knows the right number of children for them and that creating large families will help spread the word about the Bible and flood the nation with good Christians. The most famous Quiverful family is probably the Duggars from TLC's 19 Kids and Counting, although they've stated publicly that they're not part of the movement. However, they do express many sentiments and beliefs that come from quiverful culture, such as very strict gender roles, a belief in not using birth control, and allowing God to dictate the size of your family. The Bible says that children are a blessing and a gift from God. We just really felt like that we need to give this area of our life to God. Quiverful leader Nancy Campbell stated in 2009 that the womb is such a powerful weapon, it's a weapon against the enemy. The enemy, in this case, is perceived to be secular liberal culture, which includes immigrants, queer people, trans people, indigenous people, and people of color. Basically, anyone who isn't a white, conservative, heterosexual Christian. A study that was published in the Sociological Forum in 2022 looked at Christian nationalism, ethno-religious threats, and pronatalism, and found that 
that pronatalist sentiments, like those espoused by the Quiverful movement, are supported by attitudes that subordinate women. The study also found that American Christian pronatalism is associated with, one, a belief that the dominant cultural group members, whites, Christians, men, are threatened, and two, white Christian nationalism, an ideology that looks to conform American identity and values to those of a traditionalist, ethnicized Christianity. White Christian nationalists want control of the United States. This has been an open secret for decades now, and the documentary Jesus Camp that came out in 2006 was made in part to warn the public of how Christian fundamentalists were slowly and systematically taking over the Supreme Court and the Senate, and how they were indoctrinating their children into their belief systems in order to raise them up as warriors of Christ. Everything we see happening in the U.S. right now, the rise of authoritarian leaders, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the backlash against queer and trans people, the hysteria over the southern border, was predicted by this documentary, which is already almost 20 years old. This mean-spirited message, us against them, and that's what the religious right is doing in the United States now. It is dividing this country. Definitely go watch it if you haven't already. Like, it is mind-blowing how many things they got right 20 years ago. Part of the agenda of these white Christian nationalists has always been to stoke fear among uneducated rural populations, and they do this by talking about how white Christian culture is under threat from liberals and immigrants. According to them, the only way to save America is by supporting authoritarian leaders, forming militias, and having as many white Christian babies as possible. We can see it in the trad wife propaganda on TikTok, which I talked about at length in a previous video. Go check it out if you haven't already. And in the sentiments expressed in far right spaces that focus on women's bodies and how they can be used for the benefit of the Judeo Christian nation state. It's pretty much common knowledge at this point that birth rates are declining in many places across the world, and many Christian nationalists fear that white people aren't having enough babies, which leads them to promote traditional gender roles and reinforce force the message that a woman's life will be incomplete unless she becomes a mother. In a 2022 article for the Political Theology Network, Samuel Perry coined the term nationalist pronatalism to refer to the us versus them mentality that drives far-right populism. In a recent study, my co-authors and I find that this form of pronatalism is driven by cultural traditionalism regarding gender roles, patriarchy, desire for ethnocultural dominance, Christian nationalism, and perceptions of threat to ethnocultural majorities, whites and Christians. In other words, it is a concern for American fertility that is less about personal fulfillment and more about cultural and political power. And it reflects the ideals we see in authoritarian regimes around the world. These people do not want declining birth rates to be supplemented by immigration because at the heart of this movement is a simmering racism, misogyny, fascism, and xenophobia that we see rising up all around the world right now. It's similar to the kind of pronatalism that was encouraged by fascist dictators in the 20th century like Hitler and Mussolini, who stressed the importance of traditional patriarchal family values in order to encourage the production of more native-born German and Italian children. In 2019, far-right Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban introduced a series of pronatalist policies designed to encourage women to have as many children as possible. These policies included housing subsidies for single mothers, 21,000 new daycare spots, state funding for families who needed to buy vans and SUVs to haul around all these kids that they were going to have, and a lifetime exemption from having to pay income tax for women who had four or more children. On the surface, these almost seem like pro-feminist policies, but dig a little deeper and you'll see the patriarchal fascist undertones. At the same time as these policies were being implemented, Orban was also restricting access to abortion and making explicitly anti-immigration comments. He and his supporters don't just want any children, they want specifically white Hungarian children, just like American Christian nationalists want specifically white American children. It's not about the personal freedom of choice to have zero kids or ten. It's not even about letting God control the size of your family. It was never about those things. It's about controlling women's bodies and making sure that every available white womb is 
used to make white babies in the service of building a white nation state that's run by an authoritarian dictator. Julie Ingersoll, a religious studies professor, summed it up really nicely in a recent interview she did on the What A Day podcast. I'll link to it below so you can listen to the whole thing. I highly recommend it, especially if you're American. In this particular episode, they talk about how Christian nationalism is tied to patriarchy and how it found its way into the GOP and is now informing the culture wars. Well, I think that the theocrats that we're discussing see a patriarchal family as the basic organizing building block of society and policies and practices that undermine that and provide options for women to make different life choices are a threat to how they want society to be organized. Patriarchy. Even without the religious component, pronatalism is patriarchal all on its own. In a book called Gender in the Mirror, Cultural Imagery and Women's Agency, author Diana Mayers points out that pronatalist ideology interferes with women's ability to make truly autonomous, authentic choices because it seeks to obscure our distinctive needs, temperaments, capabilities, and hopes. This ends up subverting our self-knowledge and blocking our ability to imagine alternative futures for ourselves, perhaps ones that don't include marriage or motherhood. In a 1983 article for the Feminist Study journal, Nancy Fulbright argued that the social relations which govern human reproduction often reinforce the domination of women and the exploitation of women's labor. Even in a completely egalitarian heterosexual partnership, the labor of growing, carrying, and birthing a fetus falls entirely on the woman. In patriarchal societies, gender divisions of labor have always assigned the task of child care to women, which effectively excludes us from participating in public life for as long as we have to care for children at home. As I mentioned earlier, for most of human history, women couldn't plan or control when they got pregnant or the number of children they had. The invention of birth control and modern Western medicine, combined with increased access to education, has allowed women to have more control over when and how many kids we have, with growing numbers of us opting for the never and zero options. This has resulted in a declining birth rate in many Western democratic nations, hence the moral panic of the alt-right that I talked about earlier. The growing push for gender equality and LGBTQIA visibility has resulted in a backlash from the right wing. Their worldview revolves around control of women's bodies and choices, and they're doing this right now by walking back reproductive and marriage rights. We all know about abortion bans and laws that deem zygotes to be children, but these regressive laws go even further. Right now, in Missouri, Arkansas, and Texas, judges cannot legally finalize a divorce if a woman is pregnant, and these laws make no exception for domestic violence. This isn't about protecting children. If it was, there would be gun law reform to stop school shootings and better health care for women. Spacing out pregnancies and having fewer of them actually is better for kids because the fewer children a family has, the more mental, physical, and emotional resources they're able to allocate to those existing children, which sets them up for healthier and more stable lives. Embedded in patriarchal societies is an honor code that sanctifies private property as it exists under the control of men. Women and children constitute such property, and this idea is echoed in the sentiments of every cis-hetero man who wants children because he wants to leave a legacy. I'm not sure every cis-hetero man is conscious of the implications of this statement when he says it, but essentially that's what it comes down to. When a man says that he wants children, what he's saying is that he wants a woman to sacrifice her body, her public life, her very sense of self in service of that desire. Even if he's not consciously thinking that, and most men aren't when they say they want kids, the exploitation of a woman's body is inherently implicated in that statement. Obviously, this is a different story if both partners in a heterosexual relationship genuinely want to be parents and have discussed it at length. But a lot of the time, that's not the case, and women who were previously child-free or on the fence end up caving in to their partner's desire for children or compromising by having only one kid. Which isn't a compromise, by the way. There is no compromise when it comes to that decision. There are so many stories about this on the Regretful Parents subreddit and the I Regret Having Children Facebook page. So many women who caved to pressure from husbands, parents, male partners, and in-laws, and then regretted it because they never wanted to be mothers in the first place. 
This kind of pressure assumes that women don't know our own minds, that we're slaves to our bodies and our hormones, that our willpower is weak, and that society knows what's best for us better than we do. Mothers are still the default parent. On top of the physical labor of carrying and birthing a baby, a lot of the mental load and emotional labor falls to mothers as well. Men are praised and excessively validated for doing the barest of bare minimums when it comes to child care and household labor, and this is a patriarchal construct that comes from the assumption that the domestic sphere belongs to women. Gender essentialism is a fancy sociological term for the idea that all women share some innate essential property that differentiates us from men. Wrapped up in this idea is the assumption that all intellectual, social, emotional, and psychological characteristics are related to the body, and that biological sex is the driver of gender expression, which is obviously bullshit because trans and genderqueer people exist. Gender essentialism is the idea that women and men are naturally different because they possess different body parts and thus have different biological, social, and emotional drives. Gender essentialism is also used to justify discrimination and even outward violence towards women because of the assumptions that it makes about women. While it's true that only people with a properly functioning uterus and ovaries can grow and give birth to babies, and obviously that comes with some wild hormonal shifts both pre and postpartum, this idea that men and women are somehow essentially different is extended well beyond the postpartum phase, and it assumes that initial maternal investment automatically becomes long-term exclusive maternal care. Once the baby is weaned, there's no biologically rooted and exclusively feminine desire to continue to pour ourselves into caring for it. There's no innate difference between women and men in their drives to care for that baby once the postpartum phase is over. There's only a cultural habit that pressures mothers into continuing to be the primary caregiver of children as they grow, and this cultural habit is patriarchy. Cultural habits and scripts are powerful. As I explained in part one of this series when I talked about the biological clock, go check it out if you haven't already, we're steeped in these cultural narratives from day one, and they can be so deeply ingrained that they feel biological. It can feel like as a mom, you're just hardwired to be the primary caregiver for your kids, but once the postpartum hormones settle down and that baby has been weaned, biologically, women are no more apt or able to be martyrs for their kids than men are. In case you think I'm just being a radical feminazi by arguing against gender essentialism, let me point you to some data. In 2005, Janet Shibley Hyde, a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin, rounded up 46 of the 50 most well-known studies on gender differences and analyzed them for their statistical strength. These studies all looked at presumed differences in cognitive abilities, communication, social behavior, personality, and psychological well-being between cis men and cis women. She found that for 78% of the gender differences that had been measured and remeasured and measured again across all of these studies, there was actually as much of a difference within gender as between genders. The only statistically significant differences between men and women were in the areas of motor skills and frequency of masturbation. Other than that, there were just as likely to be differences between two women and two men as there are between women and men. And yet, the cultural script that women are inherently more caring and nurturing and able to care for children continues. It's especially reinforced in the universe of heterosexual relationship dynamics, and we see it seep into dating, marriage, and parenthood advice for straight people as well. Books like Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and dating coaches like Matthew Hussey all reinforce the idea that men are naturally averse to coupling up and women must shoulder the task of tricking and manipulating men into committed exclusive partnership so that we can have babies on time. The astute parent knows the difference between what a child wants and what they need. Similarly, when it comes to dating, the astute woman knows the difference between what a man wants and what he needs. I don't really know how to talk to straight women, but are y'all okay? Are you are you all right? Oh my god, you do not have to treat your partner like a child, okay? Just FYI, anybody watching this, if you have to treat your partner like a child, you should not be their partner. They do not need a partner. They do not need you. You do not need them. You do not need to be treating your partner like a child. This is why dating advice for straight people 
just gets me so mad. Taken to a wild extreme in recent years, alpha male podcasts double down on these perceived differences, setting up impossible double standards for women by claiming that we're gold diggers and whores, yet somehow also baby crazy and hardwired for monogamous partnership. The implication here being that men are not. If you, you know, took lined up 100 women, I would argue probably 90 of them have been on a date with a guy that had zero intent of having sex with. Okay, that's manipulation. At some point, when I feel like my mental health can take the hit, I will probably do a deep dive into these alpha male clowns. Let me know in the comments if you want to see that. Society tells women that we're naturally hardwired for motherhood and marriage and that we're supposed to want these things. Little girls are given baby dolls and play kitchens and easy bake ovens, and from the cradle we're shown movies and books about princesses who get swept off their feet by Prince Charming. We grow up thinking, I want that, and then we're told we'd better hurry up and get it before it's too late, manufacturing an unnecessary panic that resides deep at the core of a lot of young women and shapes how they view themselves and make decisions for their lives. This panic and desperation makes us vulnerable to exploitation by men who want our physical, emotional, and mental labor for free, and patriarchy teaches them from the cradle that they're entitled to it. It's why so many men are angry and turning to extremist movements like white nationalism and Christian fundamentalism, movements which enshrine patriarchy and reassure them that women and children are meant to be their property, that we exist only to further their bloodline and their legacy. Capitalism. Patriarchy is the foundation of capitalism, and one could not survive without the other. Pronatalism shows up in this context because it a convinces women that it's validating and feels good to be the property of a man, and b it ensures the survival of the dominant socioeconomic system. In part one of this deep dive, I talked briefly about pronatalism mythologizing and glorifying motherhood. Capitalism latches onto this and tells us stories about motherhood providing ultimate fulfillment because under capitalism we're meant to a give birth to and raise the next generation of workers and consumers and B, consume goods and services ourselves in the process of doing this. Capitalist narratives around pregnancy and childbirth tell us tales about maternal satisfaction, about pregnancy glow-ups and baby showers with elegant decor and gender reveal parties and matching mommy and me outfits and sepia-toned Instagram photo dumps and like who wouldn't want that? It all sounds fun and gorgeous, right? Children are expensive and even before they're born, there's a significant amount of money spent on them. Pregnancy tests, pronatal vitamins, all the stuff you need to buy for your baby, maternity clothes, gender reveal parties, baby showers. Even if you're one of the parents determined to do the bare minimum, most places still legally require you to have a car seat, at least, for your kid before they'll even let you take it home from the hospital. And not every woman can breastfeed, even if that was the original plan. Breastfeeding is a lot more complicated and difficult than it's often given credit for, and if you can't or won't do it, then you're going to have to buy by formula for the better part of a year. And that shit's expensive. When my sister had her baby last year, her plan was always to breastfeed. But as is the case for many women, she wasn't able to, unfortunately, and that ended up costing her an unexpected $120 per week. In Canada, the cost of raising one child from birth to the age of 17 clocked in at a whopping $293,000 as of February 2024, with an additional cost of sixty-eight to hundred and seventeen thousand dollars if that child lives at home past the age of 18, which most do. This isn't any big revelation or shouldn't be, but it shows how much stuff needs to be bought and paid for during the process of raising kids. And of course, these figures are only for one child. Imagine having three or four of them. All of this capital that gets spent on the grand project of raising up the next generation is good for the economy, so of course we're encouraged to do it. Simply put, more women having babies means more workers and more consumers. Infinite growth is the whole point of capitalism, but we live on a finite planet with finite resources and a finite population of humans, huge though it might be right now. The free labor of stay-at-home moms was once essential to the functioning of capitalism because it meant that men were then able to go to work and focus on their careers with the support of a wife at home who was expected to do all of the domestic labor and child rearing for free. Back to my earlier point about kids being a financial drain on their families rather than a financial gain as they were before modern times. Pronatalist fantasies of ultimate fulfillment and domestic bliss have to come into play here, otherwise who would do it? 
As a species, we tend to invest our resources, physical, emotional, and temporal, into the things we value, which provide us with satisfaction and joy. Child rearing can at times be sheer drudgery, so of course we need to tell ourselves these stories about it in order to invest it with that psycho-spiritual meaning that drives us to do it in the first place. The fact that birth rates are sharply declining in modern Western countries is a result of many things, but a big reason is the soaring cost of living and also the criticism of these psycho-spiritual narratives that is becoming more and more common and less taboo to talk about. If many of us can barely just afford to feed and house ourselves, if we can even do that, why would we bring a child into that? It's a sentiment that's loudly echoed throughout the child-free community and is a big reason why millennials and Gen Z are having less kids if they're even having kids at all. And while these declining birth rates are a good thing for the planet, they've got some people in our society pretty spooked. The tech elites. Pronatalism has been gaining attention among Silicon Valley elites for a number of years now, spurred on by Elon Musk's controversial and very public ramblings about declining birth rates in Western countries. In August of 2022, he tweeted that population collapse due to low birth rates is a bigger risk to civilization than global warming, which fed into a lot of the alt-right hysteria around the decline of white patriarchal Christian nationalism in the West. Is the trend for birth rate positive or negative? It's negative. Yeah, he's exactly right there. This is, this is a really important thing to bring up. That's the crisis we ought to be worried about. Not have fewer kids. We need to have a lot more of them. A lot of the tech elites are decidedly not Christian or religious at all, but the underlying fears are the same, a loss of power and control. Underlining the pronatalism of both the Christian right and the tech elites is a kind of insidious eugenics that seeks to mold and shape the next generation in its super tech genius image and eliminate marginalized populations. Some Elon stands and techies who spend way too much time online have convinced themselves that the way to save the world is for people like them to have a lot of babies, and by people like them, I mean rich, highly educated engineers who work for giant tech companies. In short, they believe that well Wealthy, genetically engineered tech elites should be breeding the poor and the stupid right out of the human species. Elon Musk has become a sort of poster boy for this movement, but there are others within it who are also very outspoken. Malcolm and Simone Collins are a married couple from Pennsylvania who are openly pronatalist and unapologetic about their plans to have as many kids as possible. We're going to have more than seven if we can, basically, until my uterus is forcibly removed in a botched surgery. <laughs> Echoing the beliefs of the Quiverful movement, but without the religious component, they profess that the only way out of the so-called population crisis is for as many people like them as possible to have kids. It seems like modernity and all the things that we consider to be good, like women's rights, like prosperity, like good quality of life, seem incompatible with flourishing humans. It, it As of last April, the couple had three children already and with their youngest went through genetic testing and embryo selection to make sure she wouldn't suffer from anxiety or become obese later in life. There are some obviously very eugenically flavored undertones to this and many have raised concerns that the couple is trying to perfect the human race through the use of reproductive technologies. Malcolm and Simone have have pointed out themselves that should their plan succeed, their bloodline will surpass the current human population in 11 generations. The website for their nonprofit, pronatalist.org, is careful to deflect any accusations of eugenicist practices by emphasizing that their goal is actually to protect and expand human diversity by raising awareness of population collapse. Considering that they're rich white people who are planning for their genetics to dominate the human species in just 11 generations, their concern for diversity is indeed a testament to how smart they are, or sarcasm aside, how stupid they think the rest of us are. They also run a school for gifted youth that emphasizes self-motivation and self-directed learning. On their website, they're careful to define gifted as simply a motivation to learn, but they also mention on their site that they want to empower students to become elite movers and shakers while still in school. Our goal is to have every student graduate as a rising leader to watch. While on the surface, this sounds great, in actual practice, it's a form of indoctrination. They're also careful to mention that they don't actually provide education, merely an experience that supplements the student's already existing curriculum. 
This is a clever way to avoid government oversight because if they actually did provide concrete education, they'd be subject to some sort of regulations around the things that they teach, and they wouldn't be able to indoctrinate their students with their ideologies. So why the fear-mongering among the tech billionaires about declining birth rates? Capitalism, obviously. As I already talked about, growing populations are good for the economy. Declining birth rates are a natural phenomenon that happen when countries increase their overall wealth and women are able to be more highly educated. As they shift from high to low fertility rates, countries tend to go through a period where there are lots of people of working age and proportionally fewer people who are either too old or too young to work. This is obviously good for the economy, but sooner or later this demographic dividend ends and the birth rate hits a plateau and then starts to decline. During the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe, a booming population ultimately led to higher rates of poverty, wealth inequality, and less access to resources, which allowed the landed aristocracy to basically enslave their tenants into oppressive serfdom under a feudalist system of government that restricted their freedom of movement and forced them into low-paying jobs. The Black Death that swept across Europe in the middle of the 14th century cut the population down by 40 to 70 percent according to some estimates. While certainly traumatic, the plague also opened up opportunities for those who survived. The sudden labor shortage gave workers more power and they were able to negotiate better working and living conditions, eventually leading to more class mobility in Europe as more and more people were able to access better resources and education over the subsequent centuries. Falling populations aren't always a bad thing. A world with lower birth rates is a healthier and more equitable world simply because there's more to go around and the working classes have more power and more ability to bargain. But when you're a tech billionaire whose wealth depends on the exploitation of cheap labor, there is indeed a cause for concern. Elon's fear of collapse is valid, but only in the case of his own personal empire, not in the grand scheme of human civilization. The effects of pronatalism. Overpopulation stresses resources and shifts power into the hands of the owner classes. By encouraging unbridled reproduction, pronatalism is a driving factor behind overpopulation, inequality, and climate change. It allows for patriarchy and capitalism to flourish by giving power to wealthy men. There are now 8 billion people in the world, and the best estimates say that we will peak at 10 billion before the end of the century. The Overpopulation Project is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to research and education about overpopulation, carrying capacity, pronatalism, and climate climate change. I'll link to them in the description box if you want to check it out. They do some really good research and outreach work. They state on their website that at current levels of consumption, today's population of 8 billion is driving resource depletion, soil erosion, water shortages, species extinctions, and climate catastrophe. Over a billion children are already at extremely high risk from climate change. High fertility rates and population growth undermine climate resilience and complicate efforts to end poverty and hunger and ensure basic services and infrastructure. These are real, actual threats to the future. They undermine the stability of our civilization far more deeply than falling birth rates by contributing to climate change and endangering the futures of the children who already exist. Even if everyone alive today was to have seven or more children like the Collins family recommends, we'd just be kicking the can down the road because those children would face a future in which resources are scarce and they'd likely die from disease or starvation or natural disasters before being able to have children themselves. Either way, our human population is going to decline. Our choices are to do it methodically and carefully while building a sustainable world for those who are alive right now or to keep pushing pronatalism, keep pressuring women into giving birth, or in some cases forcing them to give birth, and then dooming those babies and their babies to catastrophic climate collapse and possible extinction in the centuries to come. The overpopulation project stands on pronatalism in the face of declining birth rates is as follows. Rather than manufacturing a crisis whose remedy entails social engineering to roll back progress on human rights and women's control over their own lives, we should focus on the 
real crisis fueled by pronatalist pressures from family, religion, and governments that force millions into motherhood against their wishes, often by means of coercion and sexual violence. Pronatalism is obviously bad for society and the planet, and on an individual level, it objectifies babies and children by viewing them as objects for which goods and services can be bought, as vessels in which to receive and absorb our projections of correctness and morality, while being expected to complete us, fulfill us, motivate us, and carry on our legacy and cultural values. Many people who express a desire to have a baby say it in exactly those words, that they want a baby. But babies don't stay babies. They grow up into chaotic toddlers, defiant teenagers, and eventually adults with their own ideas, opinions, and lives. When they imagine themselves as parents, how many people think of being senior citizens sitting across a dinner table from their middle-aged kids? Or do they picture cute little cherub-cheeked babies? People rarely say, I'm ready and willing to do the work of raising a human when asked about their family goals. Instead, they say, I want a baby, as if babies are objects onto which we project our fantasies of domestic bliss and emotional fulfillment. Pronatalism affects us on an individual level because it dictates how we should feel about children and parenthood, especially for women. Sociologist Arlie Russell Hochschild coined the term feeling rules of society in 1979, by which she meant that there are a set of socially shared norms which influence how people want to try to feel certain emotions in any given social relationship. The feeling rules that govern motherhood dictate that women are supposed to feel nothing but unbridled joy and fulfillment once they become mothers, and any other emotion that doesn't conform to these rules is rendered taboo. There's no space in our cultural narrative for maternal indifference, ambivalence, grief, anger, depression, and regret. And the mothers who do feel these things are shamed into keeping quiet about them, which can be an isolating and psychologically damaging experience. Not only are these pronatalist feeling rules damaging for mothers, they're also misleading and possibly traumatic for the women who do find themselves having babies they never wanted or didn't expect to have and then end up regretting them. Whenever I get a new tattoo, someone somewhere always finds a way to tell me that I'll regret it because it's a permanent decision that changes my body and I can't take it back. But who, in our pronatalist society, cautions would be mothers that children are also a permanent decision that changes their body and that they can't take back. In the words of sociologist Orna Donath, who wrote an entire book about regretting motherhood, Talking about regretting motherhood calls us to rethink once again this axiom according to which each and every woman want to be a mother and each and every woman experience joy in motherhood that worth everything for her. And even if it doesn't happen at the first years, the early years, it will surely happen. Regretting motherhood disturbs the linear story of a happy ending. There is no catharsis of a happy ending. And this gets society crazy. Women's Leisure as Resistance like capitalism, pronatalism romanticizes the concept of hard work, sacrifice, and martyrdom. Under capitalist systems, workers who sacrifice their time, their well-being, and their leisure are upheld as virtuous, and the laurels bestowed by this cultural and social validation are supposed to motivate us to continue to work hard, even when we're not given adequate monetary compensation for that work. Likewise, motherhood is invested with the virtues of hard work, and pronatalism convinces women that our time Time, our bodies, our self-esteem, our independence, and our autonomy are all worthy sacrifices on the altar of maternal fulfillment. Pronatalism tells us that the joys of unbridled free time pale in comparison to our baby's smiles. Women who aren't willing to make these sacrifices because they find other things in life to be much more fulfilling are demonized and called selfish, shallow, and self-absorbed. With so much pressure on women to constantly please, sacrifice, and perform for others, our leisure is a form of resistance. With motherhood still being assumed to be the primary social role for women, leisure opportunities that are for the benefit of ourselves and no one else enable us as women to challenge these ideologies. Before I go further with this point, I want to acknowledge that in this late-stage capitalist hellscape, having leisure time at all is a privilege whether you're a parent or not. But leisure time doesn't have to be some grand expensive thing. It can look like passing out on the couch with a frozen pizza while binge-watching Netflix after a grueling 
working 12 hour shift. It can look like a hobby or an intellectual pursuit that you dedicate yourself to that builds your confidence and gives you a sense of accomplishment. It can look like a commitment to never do emotional, mental, or physical labor for anyone else unless you genuinely, truly, and authentically want to so that you're never pouring from an empty cup or making a martyr of yourself. Pronatalism perpetuates the belief that women without children are lacking, incomplete, and immature, so any and everything that we can do which we find fulfilling and regenerative that doesn't center someone else's needs is an act of resistance. Activities that we find fulfilling and that allow us to positively focus on ourselves can give us a sense of empowerment, satisfaction, and pride in our accomplishments without making those accomplishments all about other people. If you're a mom and you're watching this and you genuinely, authentically find satisfaction in motherhood more than anything else in your life, that's awesome and your kids are very lucky to have you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking right now to the mothers who regret their decision to become mothers, who are grieving for the loss of their autonomy and freedom. I'm talking to the women who struggle and have struggled with infertility and were forced to find meaning and satisfaction elsewhere. And most of all, I'm talking to the child-free women who are very clear on what we want and don't want, but still face stigmatization, demonization, and backlash from society. Child-free women are told all the time that we're going to regret not having kids, and even if we're lucky enough to have families of origin who support us in that decision, we still get backlash from everywhere else if we dare to openly admit that we're not particularly interested in motherhood. When I was in my mid-20s and about to get married, I was told by a coworker that she'd happily cover for me when I needed maternity leave. I thanked her for her kind offer and told her that I appreciated the sentiment behind it, but I wouldn't be having kids, so I wouldn't be taking taking her up on it, and then she actually started crying and told me that she was sad for me that I'll never experience a love like that of a mother towards her child. When I was 10 years old, my mom told another mom whose kids I babysat for sometimes that I had told her I didn't want any kids when I grew up. She laughed and told my mom I'd change my mind because I was good with her kids, so of course I'd have my own one day. Just last year, one of my mom's daycare dads who's around my age asked her if I had any kids and she said, no, I don't want them. He then asked my own mother what's wrong with me for not wanting kids of my own. Just a few weeks ago, I posted a clip of my last video about pronatalism on my Instagram feed and a woman I don't even know slid into my DMs with a picture of some babies and said this is what you're missing and I just know I just know that somewhere in my Instagram feed somewhere in my DMs somewhere on my Facebook page or in the comment section of this video somebody somewhere is going to tell me that I'm wrong or crazy or missing out by not having kids I just know it that's going to happen bar none anytime a child-free woman states publicly that she's not interested in being a mother somebody somewhere has something to say about it. All child-free women experience this kind of pushback time and time and time again, and if we don't get it from our families of origin, we get it from society, from coworkers, from friends, from random strangers on the internet. It never stops. It never stops until and unless our periods do and we're freed at last from the crushing weight of society's expectations, only to be told that we're ugly, undesirable, used up, dried up, scary, and lonely. Yay, patriarchy. When you're a woman and you're openly and proudly child-free, people, many of them strangers, will just as openly and proudly assume that you're making a huge mistake, that you're missing out on some great and mysterious love, that you're choosing to be empty and lonely and unfulfilled, so obviously something must be wrong with you. All of these assumptions, these are pronatalism at work. Being child-free. I'm child-free for a few reasons, mostly because, as I mentioned in part one, for as long as I can remember, I've always been hyper-aware of gendered expectations of women when it comes to birthing and raising children, and this has always made me feel defiant and rebellious. I've always hated that women are expected to be nurturing and self-sacrificing and motherly because none of those things feel true to me at my core. I experience my own femininity as being something more wild and chaotic and unpredictable, just completely at odds with the regimented schedules and predictable consistency that babies need. How I experience and express my gender in a lot of ways doesn't fit into how society frames womanhood, and something about the idea of putting my body in the service of another human being, first to receive and transform a man's genetic material, 
and then to carry and feed his baby just gives me the ick. I don't personally find pregnancy and childbirth to be beautiful, sacred, or magical. That whole process just always felt like something that would personally feel very violating to me. But that's just me, and it comes from how I experience and perceive my own body and gender, and I've felt that way about it for as long as I can remember. As far back as I can remember, whenever I saw a pregnant woman, I would think to myself, my body is mine, it belongs to me. My body is not food and shelter for someone else. Some women do enjoy nurturing and that feels authentic to them and some women are only nurturing in certain circumstances and not others and some women don't have a nurturing bone in their bodies and all of these things are okay and natural. But pronatalism assumes that all women have to love babies and love being around babies and want to have babies of their own. And this is what I've always felt very critical of and even angry about at certain times in my life, especially when my own desires and authenticity was not taken seriously. For the most part, I simply just don't enjoy being around very young children, with a few exceptions here and there depending on the kid. And that's something I've known about myself since I was a kid. It's not even that little kids annoy me, they actually don't at all, even when they're screaming and making messes. I don't find anything that little kids do to be in any way annoying or even that disrupting because I have a lot of patience for chaos, I'm okay with it. For me, it's more to do with that particular kind of boredom that comes from having to spend time with kids who are very young. I personally don't find it appealing and I've spent enough of my life around little kids to know that there's just something about the combination of boredom and hypervigilance that comes with being around them that makes my brain go into DEFCON 1 levels of like, get me out of here. I have a high tolerance for boredom in every other circumstance because I have a very vivid imagination and I can easily just slip into an active daydream if I find myself in a boring or monotonous situation that doesn't require me to be mentally present. But you can't do that when you're with a toddler or a little kid because you have to be constantly watching them and paying attention to them to make sure they don't die. There's just something about that combination of being bored but still having to be mentally present that's completely intolerable to me and I can't imagine being a mother and having to do that 24-7. Even with little kids I do like, my tolerance for that is limited. My brain needs to be free to wander around and do its thing at all times or else I just end up feeling like a caged squirrel. To me, having to be responsible for a small child 24 7 feels the exact same way as being forced to pay attention in math class. If I were to have kids of my own, I would have to be pretty heavily medicated in order to make it work and I unfortunately have to raw dog my mental health issues and my neurodivergence because medication is just not an option for me personally at this point. For anyone who's struggled with unmedicated mental illness and or neurodivergence, you know how much effort and energy it takes just to look after ourselves. No way is there anything left for a child at the end of the day. I suspect a lot of parents who struggle with ADHD or some other form of executive dysfunction that doesn't happen to hyper-focus on their kids probably feel the same way and it's something that isn't talked about nearly enough but should be. Neurodivergence complicates parenting in so many ways and pronatalism just glosses over all that to the detriment of both the kids and the parents who struggle with feelings of shame and guilt about something that isn't their fault in any way. ADHD, OCD, anxiety, and depression run in my family, and I unfortunately have all of those things. There's good research to support that neurodivergence and the mental health challenges that come along with it are genetic, and there's a high chance that my hypothetical child would inherit mine. Having firsthand knowledge and experience of how hard and exhausting and isolating it is to grow up with those particular handicaps, I would never want want to be in a position where I had to watch my kids go through those same struggles. And if I had a kid and it ended up being a girl and she continued to identify with that gender into adulthood, there would also be the added challenges of having to struggle with being a woman under the patriarchy, having to spend more money just to remain alive, we've all heard about the pink tax and that is a thing, while also navigating life at the end of an empire in the midst of a climate crisis and very probably the aftermath of a global scale conflict. I personally would feel terrible subjecting someone else to that just because I wanted the experience of being a mother. At the end of the day though, that is my choice and it's a personal choice that I feel is best for myself and my life and the lives of my unborn children. 
It's a choice that I made after a lot of self-reflection and a lot of research, taking into account my own life experiences and what I know about myself, as well as my personal ethics and morals and my own worldview, which is decidedly a little bit pessimistic. Maybe it's partially the depression and anxiety that's talking here, but overall, I don't have a ton of hope for the future of our civilization, and that factors into the decisions that I make. I view being child-free in the same way people who are vegans view their veganism. No one likes a preachy vegan, and I don't want to preach about child freedom as being better or more ethical than having your own biological kids because on a broad level, I don't actually think that it is. It's better than having kids for me and for a lot of other people, but that's not true for everyone. The decision about whether or not to have kids is going to be mainly influenced by your own worldview, your faith or lack of faith in the future, how well you know yourself, and your own capacity for self-examination. At the end of the day, it's an extremely subjective and highly personal choice, and it's not about what that choice ends up being. It's about the fact that it is a choice in the first place. Motherhood is no one's destiny. That's going to do it, my loves. This was a huge, huge topic, and there are so many things that I covered both in this video and in part one that could have been and deserve to be deep dives in and of themselves. If you're watching this, I hope I was able to at least help you think about where your true authentic desires begin and where society's expectations end. That can be really hard to discern sometimes, believe me, I know, and I'm still trying to parse that out all the time. Being a parent is in so many ways a wonderful thing, or so I've been told by those people I know who are doing it. The reality is that, like anything else in life, you're probably not going to feel just one way about it 100% of the time, and you're the only one who can decide for yourself what is and isn't worth it to you. Some days being a parent is going to be the best thing that you ever did, and other days you're going to lock yourself in the bathroom and cry and regret every decision you ever made that led to your children's existence. That's all normal. That's all life. Pronatalism tells us that parenthood is nothing but joy all the time. It doesn't leave space for authentic feelings, genuine emotions, and reactions, especially when they're messy. You're allowed to be messy even if you're a parent. You're a human being first and foremost. Now, all of this is easy for me to say. I'm obviously not a parent, which means I don't really know or understand what it's like or how hard it can be. All that I know is what I've heard from other people. So I want to leave you with the words of someone who really is a parent speaking honestly and candidly about motherhood and how pronatalism makes it hellish. This comment that I'm about to read you comes from an anonymous post on Quora, and what struck me when I read it was how all the terrible things she so beautifully articulated don't really have anything to do with her child, her love for her child, or being a mother in and of itself. They have everything to do with pronatalism and how it shapes and molds the experiences of mothers, making their lives every bit as frustrating and subject to unfair judgment and scrutiny as the lives of child-free women. But I'll give her the last word on this topic. There is a horrible side to being a mother that's undeniable. Here are a few main points of the horrible side. First of all, being a mother is deeply depersonalizing. When you meet people, even other moms, they ask your child's name but not yours. You weirdly cease to matter as a human being. You exist, but you don't count other than as a shadow to your child. Despite everything in society being geared towards women becoming mothers and everyone saying that being a mother is the most important job in the world, as a mother, you really do not matter as a person, as yourself. It's the biggest con affecting women in our society. No one cares if you are okay, if your life is devoid of fun or pleasure pleasure of any kind or if you are struggling. You should be completely fulfilled by motherhood alone. If you are not, something is wrong with you and you do not deserve sympathy. End of story. As a mother, you are basically a glorified servant. Unless you can afford full-time live-in nannies, something not ideal anyway as your children need you to show your face more than now and then, and cleaning personnel or have family willing to sacrifice themselves for you and your child by doing the work for you, you will spend the rest of your days cleaning, cooking, tidying, mending, taking kids to activities, taking them back from activities, reading them the same books over and over, shopping for endless amounts of groceries and clothing, taking dirty clothes off them, changing dirty nappies, giving baths, putting on clean nappies while they walk away, putting clean clothes on them, washing and putting away clothes for them, trying to convince them to go to bed, dealing with meltdowns, washing their dishes, brushing their teeth, and clipping their nails in the middle of the night because they won't let you otherwise, washing their hands while they scream, prepare and convince them to eat their snacks and meals, and all this while you watch them like a hawk 24-7 in 
case they manage to find a way to choke on something or pull something heavy on their head and feet. It's all your responsibility. You have to do it and it never ends. Something goes wrong no matter how small and society, while not helping you in any way, shape, or form, is ready to rain on you like a ton of bricks. Bad mother. It's never the father who gets judged. Everyone feels entitled, nay obliged, to tell you what you are doing wrong in your day to day while experts keep insisting that you have to follow your instincts and do what works for you. Perfect strangers in shops, in the street, or in restaurants will proffer their most unwanted opinion on matters regarding your child and his upbringing. Oh, he looks so tired. Yeah, thanks. Ah, he's very hungry. Sure, if you say so, lady. The game is that you are supposed to justify yourself, explaining exactly when you last fed your own baby or put them down for a nap and what they ate, the wrong thing for their age usually, and how long they napped for and why. You have to convince civilian CPS everywhere in town that you are feeding your own kid. They care about your child more than you do, obviously. It doesn't matter if he's the happiest little chubby cherub ever, smiling from ear to ear. They're all very, very concerned. Because you are not doing what they did, so you must be doing it very, very wrong. Also, if you are still breastfeeding, it's high time you stopped, and if you are not still breastfeeding, well, babies really benefit from it, and in not doing it, you are taking away a healthy future from your own child because you are just too selfish to care. It's enough to make you murderous. Motherhood is a life of sacrifice and isolation. Your child-free friends have no idea of what you're talking about half the time and wonder why you never go out. Other moms are too busy to chat on the phone or actually get to know you or you them, and even when you do get to chatting, it's all and just about kids. Your life becomes an endless stream of anxiety and tension as you try to keep your kid alive, badgered on all sides by people who judge and check on you without helping. Motherhood brings out a different side of women. It doesn't matter who you used to be before you gave birth, you will change. Hormones, exhaustion, the harsh reality that you are alone, and the crushing weight of responsibility will do wonders in turning you into another person altogether. You have those who become incredibly competitive. Oh, your child started walking at 14 months? That is very late, i.e. your mothering skills are extremely poor. Mine was walking at 9 months of age running by nine months and two weeks and he actually took off flying by 10 months and it's all because of my outstanding mothering skills of course. Then you have the Martinettes, Gina Ford style super moms who will let you know what you should be doing, encourage independence in a newborn who can't even move by putting them to sleep alone in their own room from birth or ideally getting them their own flat nearby, enforce a strict routine, wake them up at 6 a.m., give them a cold shower to make sure they're awake, then put them down for a nap at 8 a.m. and wait until they cry themselves to sleep, resisting the urge to hug them better even if they cry for two hours straight, and once they're sleeping, wake them up again after 10 minutes, you know, to show them who's boss, teach them to eat by themselves, sign language, to walk and use the toilet by six months of age, etc. Then you have the big enthusiasts, those mothers who will rave like absolute lunatics at everything to do with babies. They loved pregnancy. Every time they were sick, it was pure bliss because it connected them more deeply with their precious hidden one. At every little kick, they dropped to their knees, crying from joy when they pooped themselves during delivery. It was ecstasy itself because it meant that their beloved was finally coming out. The nights with no sleep and three hours straight of breastfeeding every half hour break with no time to eat, sleep, or wash were just better than a month's holiday in Barbados. And quite frankly, if you think any different, you don't deserve that baby and you should let someone else raise it. And finally, you have the isolationists, mums that look freaked out, stunned by the magnitude of what they are dealing with. They sit back at baby groups, not looking anyone in the eye for fear of encountering the above-mentioned types. You can never again open up to anyone about how you really feel. It's extremely taboo to complain or express any negative emotion about anything when you're a mother. Whether you develop diabetes, incontinence, hypothyroidism, or postnatal depression, or simply if your hair is falling out in chunks or your body turned into a couch and you are struggling to adapt, as soon as you tell anyone about the way that you, that you feel about it, they will immediately shoot you down with the motherhood classic passive-aggressive guilt tripping phrase still it was all worth it right that really is just a way to shut you up while redirecting the attention away from yourself and onto your baby again where it belongs because you do not matter anymore and you better drill that into your skull sooner rather than later as a reply it's completely besides the point as worth has no bearing on how you are feeling everyone else is entitled to feelings not you not you mom after that phrase is uttered you can't help but say yes of course i love having developed diabetes because i have a baby now heck 
like, I wish I developed dozens of debilitating diseases during and after pregnancy because it's just so worth it. Saying anything else would tag you as ungrateful, unmotherly, and selfish. You have to say, nay, think that everything is worth it, whatever that means, no matter how depressing, unfair, or painful, and never mention your grievances ever again. Your brain becomes mush. It's been scientifically proven that during pregnancy, some of the fetus's cells migrate into your motherly brain. This is a very effective evolutionary tool. As your brain is less and less sharp, inquisitive, and active, you are more likely to just sit around glaring contentedly at your bundle of joy all day, making them the sole focus of your existence as opposed to pursuing other interests you might have. Your brain has been squatted. These are the main things that are horrible about being a mother. They mostly don't involve the child per se, but rather the rest of society. They do nevertheless exist and they have to be reckoned with sooner or later. You can embrace them, you can resist them, or you can pass the buck to someone else to some extent, but they will still be there waiting for you, ultimately inescapable. And of course, it's all worth it. Toodaloo! Thank you.